thank you all for coming. So good to see um, familiar faces and new faces as well. Kristen, hey, what's up? The yoga and poetry worlds are colliding for me. <laughs> Matt, what's up? All right. <laughs> um, and thank you so much to Malvern Books for hosting this event, and thank you so much to my friend Brian for reading. Um, you know, Brian and I were in the creative writing program together at the University of Houston, so his work's always inspired and challenged me. And um, when the folks at Malvern asked me if I knew of any local poets who might be interested in reading, uh, I immediately thought of Brian, so that was wonderful. Um, I'm going to read a few poems first from Starship Tahiti which I describe as a kind of uh, creation myth in reverse. So the poem begins with some poems based on Rikers Island where I taught inmates for almost three years and then moves backwards in time chronologically and ends with some poems about um, my early childhood experience. So I'm going to start actually you know, continuing the theme of metal, metal music. I'm going to start with the penultimate poem in the book which is also a kind of um, ars poetica, so it's a story about you know becoming a writer or um, uh, you know what led me to embracing uh, poetry and expressing uh, things through language, and it also uh, mentions the metal band Metallica. And one of the things I was thinking about is, you know, uh, why was Metallica so great early on, and then you know they cut their hair and. <laughs> did a documentary, and, and then they kind of sucked. So like, after that, like, not as good, right? So I was thinking about that too. Is just how does an, an artist sustain his or her intensity and drive, yet also uh, continually recreate himself or herself? So this is called Metallica Burns on the Altar of the Viking Rock Star. It was thrash in a steel town day jobs as night managers, tending an oracle of gasoline fires and industrial accidents. Flaming suddenly into verse and chorus, they wanted to be poured into glass bottles and hurled. This was their first album, before detox, before therapy, forced to cut their hair and reflect. The awkward postures of youth resemble something molting, ripping through a hairy pod and spitting goo from its mandibles, waving its praying mantis limbs in a strobelic cloud of pheromones. The first recording I ever made was in the basement of my grandmother's house. My friend Charlie and I told stories into a tape player describing the exploits of Vikings who pillaged and fucked their way through southern Maryland. I'd read many fantasy novels, but I liked the cover illustrations best paintings of muscled heroes armed with swords and women clothed in animal skins, kneeling or chained or thrown over the hero's shoulder. My friend, a foster kid, showed me the scars on his stomach and legs from numerous skin grafts. When he was an infant, his mother dropped him in boiling water or spilled it on him, accidentally or not, and he was taken from her and raised by our neighbor a drunken army lieutenant. I imagine him compelled to speak by an indescribable pain inflicted on him before he knew words. Our stories overlapped and entangled as we recorded them, stopped and replayed the tape to hear our voices. Thrill of an exotic beast captured, prowling the yard. The patterns of its striped coat shifting as its muscles lengthened. Once the tape was found, my punishment was to listen while my parents and grandparents blasted it at the dining room table. Dear elders, I'm still shaming you, writing it down now so you can't erase the pulverizing drum. Go ahead, you can taste this paper lubricated with semen and bourbon. It's flammable and your names may be written there, leaves destined for a manual on how to become a Viking rock star. So, um, the next poem that I'm going to read, I wrote down a little set list. Let me take out my list. <laughs> Last night, um, 
my wife and I went to Stubbs for the first time, and we saw Eagles of Death Metal. The Eagles of Death Metal. And um, I also don't do drugs anymore, like Brian. <laughs> and uh, and I don't drink. And but but at this concert, we suddenly realized we were surrounded by waves, clouds of festooning weed smoke, just co just covering over. You know, it's kind of like when I was a kid, and they used to have a. a a truck that would drive around the neighborhood spraying mosquito repellent into the air. I felt like I was engulfed by one of these clouds. <laughs> and so by the time we left the Eagles of Death Metal, we were pretty much stoned, I'd say. Pretty much stoned. <laughs> so then when I woke up this morning, I had that experience that I haven't had, you know, in, in like 20 years of like, where am I and what am I doing? I was waking up. So. And I, I thought, I better write down a list of what I'm going to read at this reading. So um, this all actually relates to the poem I'm about to read, I promise you, <laughs> which is called Feed Your Demons. And it's based on a, a practice in Tibetan Buddhism of visualizing uh, your demons, metaphorically speaking, you know, your inner adversaries or um, forces within the self that you're in conflict with. and then asking those demons what they need for nourishment, and then imagining giving yourself over to those demons and providing them with that food. So um, this is called Feed Your Demons. If I feed them whiskey, pouring oak stung blossoms down their throats, a wave of rash would plume my face, feathered like the Egyptian god Horus, his hawk's head streaked with gold, if I feed them lotus droppings, pollen culled from Afghani fields, I'll pass out again in the cab of my black Chevy truck and sink into a tar pit in 1930s California. If I feed them flesh, pastel rubbings of nudes, chalk lines vanishing inside rouged interiors, they will not be satiated by masterpieces, but hunger for more. If I feed them fists, blades, bullets, a vest of explosives, if I feed them promises, reflection, regiment, they will not surrender but entrench, blend into the jungle, recruit from legions of unseen insect life. If I feed them songs, arias smoking through unscreened windows, they will flame and grow larger. I can only open a door to the vestibule where oily saints absorb street flames and let them with their slow needles devour me. So um, from earlier in the book, I'll read a couple of the poems that relate to my, uh, my experience teaching on Rikers Island. And um, there's one way to get on Rikers Island if you're a civilian, and that's taking the Q101 bus from Queens Plaza, one stop, Rikers Island. So the Queens, the 101 bus goes uh, from Queens Plaza to Rikers and back again, back and forth, back and forth. And so I rode that Q101 bus uh, five days a week to, to get to the uh, island. The poem's called The Q101 Bus to Antigone. We board the Q101 bus quietly, like bruises that swell under hotel room sheets. In the last seat, she touches photos of Juan that are already burning. Images of a teenager posing in his shiny gray suit. His prom date in high heels that blister her toes. These are the cells staring from her palms while he lingers at the rim of a prison toilet bowl, eager to vomit ghosts. Rough tongues of handheld metal detectors frisk me as I enter HDM, the max security jail. Inside the classroom, Juan is one of 20 inmates laughing or sleeping or banging on their desks. I write the word Antigone on the board, chalk dusting my fingers, not the same used to outline a body at the heart of a crime scene, the map of a corpse many convicts claim never to have seen, even with the murder weapon registered to their alias, even as their mothers ride the Q-101 bus to Rikers starburst decals on their red fingernails, clicking against steel railing, steel railing in the visitor's room. Mm -hmm. 
And then um, one of the things that is very important to prisoners are letters, for obvious reasons. And um, you know, I was teaching, basically I was teaching GED prep courses to inmates who were between 18 and 21 who had all dropped out of high school, but who were studying to get their GED. And in some cases they could get their um, high school diplomas. And so, entre vous, <laughs> wherever you are. So, um, so I was teaching language arts. I was teaching language arts, and many times the inmates would bring me letters that they'd been working on and say, could you help me with this letter, right? And then sometimes they would say, could you take this letter and mail it? And at that I would have to say no, <laughs> right? We weren't allowed to actually mail uh, things for inmates or to take anything out of the prison. Um, so this poem's called Prison Letters, Prison Letters. Heat sensors can detect where the prison sensors warm hands open these letters, searching for a fault line in the gene code. Any lifeline to the outside that hasn't been destroyed. A letter that begins, Ramon, your mother is very ill. Please mention to your parole board. Whatever can be stolen and claimed by thieves is. Most perishable may be sent. Letters soaked in perfumes or oils to conjure a wild garden of memory in the day room. A candlelit bathtub of floating rose petals mingled with flashes of arrival on his knees crying like a bitch. Unless you separate them, these odors can cripple you. Rip your orange jumpsuit off your shoulders like the flimsy summer dress of a woman who asked you to protect her from your older brothers. These letters sent into a smoldering pit deeper than regret. More convincing than fingerprints or mug shots, they escape underground, hijacking mail trucks and planes to slip outside prison walls. Has anyone here been to um, Portland, Oregon? Ah, a few of them. It's kind of like Austin's sister city, right? In a sense? I lived in Portland, Oregon for a year. Um, this next poem that I'm about to read is set in Portland, Oregon. I lived in Portland, Oregon in 1996 and 1997, um, and I had this romantic idea that I was going to uh, work a blue collar job during the day and then write at night. So I got a job working in the Doc Martin warehouse as a forklift operator. And, um, and I was so exhausted after a 10 hour shift at the warehouse that I didn't really get much else done. Um, this, is called, this poem's called Storming the Warehouse. One thing that I was doing before I left Portland was I was doing some training to work with homeless youths. And many of these homeless kids um, were you know, skate punk kids who lived under the bridges. Uh, in Portland. Storming the Warehouse. Praise be the river finders in their currents of healing estuary. The yellow boombox throbbing on the motel dresser as she straddles me. Her face pierced by fish hooks and beads the color of salmon eggs. I drive her back to the park where swaths of green bisect the city into encampments of corporate flow. Her Indian friend, Mighty Mouse, recruits me for the tribal basketball team. We ain't so tall, but we got moves. Follow the river. Purchase a board and cruise to the skate park near the Columbia Bridge underpass. She swore I'd find them there. Homeless kids they call trolls, soliciting tribute. Goat shepherdesses selling broken staffs as Cerebus sprawls beside them a duffel bag of greased barrels without triggers. Afternoon stunt tricks and withdrawal. The king's men racing above from castle to castle, office high rise to luxury condo. I am not speaking of the bridge, rather of plywood ramps and lean-tos on these river banks the Indians shunned, calling Portland the Valley of Sickness. Praise be the river finders, River of suffering, no Ganges of burning pyres. This Columbia where suicides are peppered with cloud spray. 
She rides me in the motel room as Fugazi pummels her boombox, her face the face of my cousin in pain, except he's six eight and bearded. Let our feet trail bandages as we storm the Doc Martens warehouse, ransacking aisles for boots, ox blood, and steel toed, plastered with pink skulls or green shamrocks that glow in the dark as we march to the castle gates, our torches hissing in the rain. I'll just read a couple of more poems. This next one is a love poem. If you were waiting for one, this is about to occur. <laughs> and this is for my wife Elizabeth, who's here. It's called Seawall. If I could find you in the morning, I'd kneel on any balcony and listen to vines stretching east, their ivory bell towers glistening in sunlight. Last night at the cinema, you said something about the front row, about images striking you directly before they were diluted by a seawall of dark heads. If I woke beside you, I'd string my Tibetan skull beads over your bare throat, their teeth and eye sockets of yak bone clicking above your breasts. If we are always facing a screen, a tapestry of green silk like water, may we break open continuously and spill over it, sand called black beauty pouring from our mouths. This will be the last poem, I think. There actually is a sand called Black Beauty. My first job was at a nuclear, where, uh, a nuclear power plant. And um, I also was a forklift operator. So when I moved to Portland, I had credentials <laughs> in forklift operation. And I, and I actually do remember the uh, sand that was called Black Beauty. They used the reactors. Um, I, moved away to West Virginia and then to Pittsburgh in 2010. We lived in Pittsburgh for two years. And um, while we were living in West Virginia, I taught at a place called Bethany College for a couple of years. Um, we also visited a zoo, which is the only accredited zoo in West Virginia, just called the Good Zoo. Good <laughs> Zoo. Tiny zoo, it's only 30 acres the zoo, right? But um, as we were looking at going through this zoo, which is kind of like a wonderful respite from our lives in West Virginia, you know, to go to this really unusual place, um, we saw a golden lion marmoset. You know, are you familiar with those creatures, those amazing creatures, the golden lion marmosets? Very small monkeys with these really uh, incredible manes, goldish red manes. And uh, believe it or not, back then, I had really long hair, and it was red. So that's kind of good to know for the poem. <laughs> so uh, the U is like right here in the front row, actually. The, the U is the, my wife who's with me during this uh, travel, the, the, this, this trip to the Good Zoo. Golden Lion Marmoset. I've never seen an animal so much like you, she screams. He looks just like you when you're angry. <laughs> a golden lion marmoset stares at us, his face scrunched like the knuckles of a leather glove weaponized with spikes, eyes lacquered with rage. Found only in Brazil, the sign reads, their native habitat of tropical rainforests reduced to 2%. 2% of what, I wonder? Maybe of its former foliated lushness, its phosphorus panthers and gajillionipedes? Or is it 2% of the total biosphere, the earth a coal miner in West Virginia put on bed rest, who sips oxygen through a straw and fixes to croak? I'm no monkey mama, because if I had 2% of anywhere less alien than myself in which to live, I'd assume full lotus and go nova. I've been an ape in hell, the Markman Theater in Steubenville, where the ticket ta taker saw the silk screen of Hanuman on my shirt and said, cool man, I like his Facebook page. The film about future and past versions of oneself slaughtering each other, she and I agreed.
especially the scenes with the boy whose telekinetic powers made people's bodies explode. If you are reading this and an older version of yourself has not yet returned to kill you, I am still 98% golden lion marmoset. So are you. And if you wish to survive without succumbing to spiritual hypnotism or psychotherapy, visit the good zoo near Wheeling. Beyond the outdoor enclosures for ostrich and spectacled bears, inside a converted barn that reeks of snake shit, a red-haired banshee leaps into space, hurling himself toward the 2% that lies between you. All right, thank you.